County Court, your uh, court ruling, base your property tax system. I don't want to get too deep into this. I'll explain it quickly. Residents in Allegheny County sued the county for a reassessment. That was a dumb move. <laughs> but the county didn't want to have, do the reassessment. They took them to court. They went through Commonwealth Court, went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The ultimate ruling was that yes, the base year property tax system, meaning the last time your county reassessed, whenever that was, is unconstitutional. The upshot of it is, if you want to be constitutional, it means you have to look at a reassessment countywide every two to three to four years to keep the values fair, supposedly. The average cost of countywide reassessment in Pennsylvania is $10 million. That means every three or four years, you're going to spend $10 million, which you're going to pay for in county property taxes, in an effort to try to keep an unfair system fair. It's insanity. We're trying to fix something that's irreparably broken. Pressure from taxpayers' groups and the media. The media has gotten all over this. We've had editorials and stories about it all over the place, but the taxpayer groups are really starting to have an effect. Five years ago, not so much. Now, 75 groups, tens of thousands of people. A real quick example, the bill we're talking about tonight was in the House Finance Committee. They held two hearings on it, and then had a three-hour meeting to decide what to do with it, and in the end, the bill was tabled. What that means generally, when you table a bill, it's dead, and the media said it was dead for the year. What was interesting was, 10 days after the bill was tabled, the House Finance Committee called an emergency meeting. And in a unanimous vote, removed it from the table and sent it to the House Appropriations Committee for a fiscal analysis, which, which is what they should have done in the first place. What caused it was taxpayer pressure. It's my understanding that a couple of the representatives on the House Finance Committee got hammered by their constituents over the vote, especially the one who proposed to table the motion. And they finally thought, we have to run for cover and we are going to get this bill out of the committee now. Otherwise, we're going to die here. Don't tell me that there's no pressure from the taxpayer groups. And finally, diminishing opportunity to fund property tax replacement from a state level source. When I started doing this in 2004, we were looking at replacing $8 billion in school property taxes. Now it's 12.9, call it 13 billion. A $5 billion increase in just eight years. At that time, there was a plan like this proposed that would have brought the base of the sales tax, the taxable items, to cover almost everything, but reduce the rate to 4%. That would have covered the $8 billion that was necessary. Can't do it that way anymore. And I'll explain the financing tonight. But the fact is, we are rapidly running out of the ability to do this from a state level. If this goes on two, three, or four years, we're going to be looking, if we want to try to do it then, and I don't even see it being possible, We'd be looking at a 10% sales tax, a 6% income tax, to try to do it just because of the level of taxes by that time. But it keeps increasing at the rate it has, that's what's going to happen. Another reason why this is the time for change. American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, released a, re released a report every year uh, called the Rich States, Poor States Report. Now, there's, there are those who say Alex is a right-wing organization, we shouldn't trust them, but this is a comparison state to state. It makes no difference. Politics doesn't matter anything. In that report, Pennsylvania came up 46th in economic performance, 43rd in economic competitiveness, 41st in out-migration. People are leaving the state in droves. Anthony Davies is a professor of economics at Duquesne University. He described Pennsylvania's out-migration problem as a symptom of increasing property taxes, and I'm quoting here, which along with increased income taxes affects what young college graduates choose to work and live. They can go anywhere they want, so of course the states that are going to attract them on average are states with lower property taxes. See what's happening with the out-migration? The young people leave. Who's left? <laughs> All the older folks who put the cost as the young people go out of the state. Beyond that, <clears throat> February 2012, Tax Foundation, they're truly nonpartisan, released a comparative analysis of state tax costs on business. This is a measure of business friendliness. Pennsylvania was ranked 49 of 50 for new businesses and dead last at 50 for mature, established firms. 
Not only is Pennsylvania's tax burden that includes the property tax discouraging new businesses and the jobs they create from locating here, it's also driving existing <coughs> businesses out of Pennsylvania. I got an email a few weeks ago from a man in York County. He owns a business down there servicing trucks. He has nine employees. His business is going well. He was looking to open a second location. He found a location near York. He was planning on hiring nine more employees. The rental on the location was $24,000 a year. His attorney started doing work on it and found that the property taxes were going to be $23,000 a year. <laughs> he killed it. Where is the new business going? Maryland. Right across the board. Nine jobs in one business in Pennsylvania, a business that would have helped build Pennsylvania's economy, that would have helped to grow jobs, is now in Maryland. This is what it's doing to small business in Pennsylvania. Yes. We started the capital stock and franchise phase out again for big businesses. But in Pennsylvania, 80% of non-government employees are employed by small businesses. The mom and pop shops, the people that hire, that have, that have less than 500 employees, they get very little help from the state. And small businesses have told us time and again, they don't want to expand, they don't want to hire because of the uncertainty of the property tax in future years. Small businesses are stagnant in Pennsylvania, and a lot of it is due to the property tax. We've heard the argument, no, you shouldn't eliminate the taxes for business, just for homeowners. This is a very good reason why you eliminate for everybody, besides the fact that it require a constitutional amendment. The question for you, what's Pennsylvania's largest industry? Anybody know? Agriculture. Agriculture, very good. Farms. Farms are being destroyed by the property tax. <coughs> Family farms that have been in, in families for generations. I'm not talking about the big agribusinesses like Archer Daniels Midland. We're talking about family farms that have been, have been in families for generations are being sold off piece by piece. It's a death of a thousand cuts as these farmers sell off chunks of their land each year just to be able to pay their property taxes. I gave this talk about six months ago in Monroe County. A woman came to me afterwards. She said her father, 10 years ago, had been farming 40 acres of Christmas trees. Now, Christmas trees have a low maturity, so he doesn't necessarily make a lot of money off his 40 acres each year. That was 40 acres 10 years ago. Today, he's farming 10 acres. In the past 10 years, he has sold off 40 acre, 30 acres rather of his farm just to pay his property taxes. The biggest industry in Pennsylvania are golden goose, and we are killing it with property taxes. How unfair is that? <coughs> Bottom line, Runaway property tax are destroying Pennsylvania's economy, devastating job-producing small businesses, and driving away its residents. There's the solution. Replace the school property tax with a more broad-based and equitable funding system. This is what we're proposing. <coughs> property tax and independence act. It has been introduced in the House of Representatives by Representative Jim Cox of Berks County. In the Senate, it is SB 1400 by Senator David Argall. I'm sure some of you in this area must be familiar with Senator Roger. He's right next to you. Identical language for both bills. So I'm going to explain to you what, what it does and how it works. Excuse me, did he show up? Did they show up? No, they are not here. I'm sorry about that. All right. so Jim and Dave told me they weren't able to make it. I don't see Senator, you. apologies. All right. I'm very sorry. Uh, and in, in the case of, in both cases, in fact, they generally sent me as a proxy when they can. Uh, Something unique about the bill before we go into this. Most legislation in Harrisburg is written by the lawmakers, the way they see best. I've been told, and I don't wish to denigrate any of the lawmakers here tonight, but I've been told that in some cases, the special interests walk into their offices and, and, and practically dictate legislation to them. From the get-go, November 2010, the PCTA was involved in the crafting of this legislation. We gave our input into it. We were asked every step of the way about the provisions. Our suggestions were incorporated in the bill. This was a true collaboration between the legislature and the grassroots activists. This just doesn't happen in Harrisburg politics. This is our bill. This is the people's bill. And for a change, we have a voice in how we want to be taxed and how we want the government to be run. And for us, this is just such an honor and a privilege to, be, to have been able to do this and participate in this kind of legislation. So, here are the goals. In November 2010, we set the goals for this legislation, what we were trying to do. 
Total elimination of the school property tax. Total elimination to be phased in over a two-year period, and I'll give you details on this in a minute. Total elimination of school board taxing ability. Never again can they nail you with, this, with school property taxes. <laughs> Stabilization of school funding and establishing realistic limits on K-12 education spending. The elimination had to be tax revenue neutral for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's no reason why you should pay any more in taxes than you're paying right now, statewide. Second, the governor has signed the Americans for Tax Reform pledge that says he will not approve anything that's a tax increase. So this absolutely has to be tax revenue neutral. We have a statement from the Americans for Tax Reform saying that the bill as proposed is tax revenue neutral and the governor can sign the bill without violating the ATR pledge. The bill calls for a moderate expansion of the sales tax base to include more items and services and Increasing the rate to 7%. Let's talk about the expansion for a second. Um, I did it again, I outran my notes. The expansion is going to include, include things like candy, haircuts, gum, newspapers, magazines, food, not on the WIC list. Anybody know what the WIC list is? The WIC list stands for women's, women, infants, and children. Anything on the WIC list is not subject to taxes. You can actually live from the food on the WIC list, but if you like the Twinkies, you're going to pay sales tax. Clothing. Any individual item of clothing, this is not the aggregate, any individual item of clothing with a value of more than $50. Now think about that for a second. How many items of clothing do you buy that cost more than $50? Underwear, polo shirts, shoes. They're all less than $50. Uh, had an argument earlier tonight, no, I shouldn't say an argument, a discussion by a gentleman about legal services. Legal services can be taxed too, with the exception of criminal and domestic cases. This is the power in the bill, the expansion of the sales tax base. Pennsylvania, of all the states, has the narrowest sales tax base. It's the narrowest one in the country. Most states tax far more than we do. Some tax practically everything. This gives us the ability. People have said to me, why haven't other states done this? This is the reason. Other states don't have the ability to do what we're doing here. It would have been a choice between expanding the base of taxable items and services or increasing the rate further. Increasing the rate further just was not acceptable. And in fact, without expanding the base, the rate would have had to go to 13%. I'm sure you would not have wanted to pay a 13% sales tax. Increase the state personal income tax to 4.01%. It's currently at 3.07. That would be an increase of 0.94%. But I will mention something here that didn't enter into these numbers. Last Saturday, Amazon.com started charging sales tax in Pennsylvania. They do a huge business in this state. And this is going to change the numbers, we think, drastically. I'm not going to know what's happening probably until the end of the last quarter of this year until we get a full quarter of sales and revenue from Amazon. The, the way the bill is structured, if revenue increases, the rate of the income tax goes down. If Amazon does what we expect them to do, or if they generate the revenue we expect, you can see a considerable drop in that 4.01. What we looked for here was a blended taxing structure that wouldn't necessarily hit one group of people harder than another. Splitting it between the sales tax and the income tax manages to do that. There's a couple of other small funding pieces in there. For example, the uh, roughly $850 million goes right now to property tax rebates. We won't need that anymore because there won't be property tax rebates. The rent rebates would stay unaffected. $850 million for property tax rebates goes into the pot. And there it is, Act 1 gambling revenue. And probably the most contentious issue, but I think after I explain it, you're going to understand it. A small retained property tax for long-term debt. The previous versions of the bill called for replacing all school district revenue from the state level. There were a lot of complaints from people who lived in frugal districts saying we don't want to pay extra income tax or extra sales tax to pay the bills of high spending districts like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or, I don't know, do you have a problem with books, Baron? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, in fact, we were looking at, we at $2.3 billion annually just to meet debt service, which would have meant roughly another half a point increase in the income tax to finance it. Not acceptable. 
And when Jim Cox and I were working together on this, we said, why not leave school district debt with the school districts to pay off? That gets rid of the $2.3 billion at the state level. At the same time, it removes the argument about frugal districts having to pay for the big spenders. Statewide, school district debt service averages about 10% of a school district's budget. The highest we found was 18% in one district. Actually, in many districts we saw were far less than 10%. But well, what it amounts to is, first year after enactment, the bill freezes the property tax at its current rate. Second year, the property tax goes away completely, except for whatever is allowed for to pay that retained debt. This is effective as of December 31st, 2011, so the school boards cannot load up on debt now in anticipation of this bill passing. Whatever debt was on their books as of that date is all they're going to be able to finance through property taxes. They cannot add any additional debt. They cannot add any more expenditures financed by property taxes. It's that one small piece, and when the debt is paid off, that goes away as well. 18 school districts in Pennsylvania have no long-term debt, and they will see their property taxes completely eliminated at the beginning of year two. 